So, most people think it's easy to spot the pediatric emergency, and it usually is, except when it comes to pediatric cardiac disease. And sometimes, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. I have a disclaimer. I pretty much have a disclaimer every single day of my life, but today's disclaimer is that I'm a pediatric cardiac intensivist. And to me, right, everything is pediatric cardiac disease. Um, if you were hoping this talk would be about the collapsed neonate, I'm very sorry to disappoint. I'm not going to be talking about neonates. But if that's what you're looking for, I can refer you to a really lovely podcast from Smack Chicago called Young at Heart. I want to talk about recognition, the recognition specifically of children over one month of age with life-threatening cardiac disease. And I know you're thinking, that's all right, I'll just pull out my ultrasound, and that's how I'll rule it out. Well, sure, that would be great if that was on your differential diagnosis to begin with. So if you've not even thought about cardiac, you're not going to be pulling this out. Trainees have asked me, why are you telling me about something that I'm never going to see? And my response is, maybe you have seen it, you just didn't know it. I work at um, a freestanding children's hospital in Southern California. I live in a county of about three million people, and our ED gets about 90,000 uh, visits per year. And about once a month, a child will present with undiagnosed cardiac disease, either acquired or congenital. And it's usually their second or third visit to the emergency department that this gets picked up. So I'm going to use this room here for a second. We have, what, around 2,500 people at this conference. And I'm going to pretend for a moment, or you're going to pretend for a moment, that you are each a child in a cardiac emergency department. And I'm going to use Vic here for a moment. And she's going to take this lovely heart that I have. And in all fairness, it's kind of squishy, so she's not going to be able to throw it very far. But she is going to throw it out to somebody in the audience, and I need someone to catch it. Why don't you come out here and just better, you know? The reputation of Australian cricket is on oh, the line. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, well done. <laughs> so you, who just caught the heart, I don't know where you are, you represent the child that has shown up three times to the emergency department with life-threatening cardiac illness, and you really hope that someone can recognize it. Now, I've been asked many times to review cases of missed cardiac disease, and of course, everything is perfectly clear when you're looking through a retrospectoscope. These cases are hard to find and easy to miss, but in every case, there was some subtle clue that could have helped direct us towards something cardiac. Chest pain, that's not subtle, and by the way, Pediatric cardiac patients present as everything except for chest pain. Also, desaturation, cyanotic neonate, not subtle. Uh, abnormal rhythm on the monitor, that's not subtle. And a whopping murmur that you can hear from across the room, that's also not subtle. That's the low-hanging fruit. We're not going to discuss that. Cardiac disease can masquerade as almost anything, from respiratory distress to abdominal pain to all of those things in between. And because it's so variable and nonspecific, recognition is the key. And the frightening part is this patient could die the day after being seen in your emergency department. In the state of California, our autopsy reports show that there are 30 children every single year who die from a missed diagnosis of congenital heart disease. That's a bit frightening. So I'm going to review five cases with you guys. And obviously, you know the answer is cardiac. But I'd like you to, as I present the cases, think about what was the tip off that it might have been something cardiac? What was the red flag? And then we're going to go over some tips at the end of each case. 
So I'd like to start with this cute little seven-year-old girl. She moved to the United States um, from China about four years ago, and she's had two weeks of abdominal pain and distension. She's been seen twice by medical providers. She's been diagnosed with viral whatever and given some antibiotics and uh, antiemetics. But now she's coming to the emergency department because it's getting worse. So she has worse abdominal pain and distension. And two months ago, she did a color run. That looks quite fun. And ever since then, she's been fatigued and has intermittent emesis. Her exam, yeah, there's some mild ascites. She's got occasional PVCs that you can see on the monitor. And she's got, I don't know, her labs aren't that impressive. You think maybe mild dehydration. And because it's her third visit to a provider in two weeks, you get an abdominal ultrasound. And there's some ascites and small bilateral pleural effusions. And because of the pleural effusions, we get an x-ray and see this. And she gets an echo ordered. A BNP is 1400, so it's markedly elevated. And the echocardiogram shows that she has a very poorly functioning and dilated ventricle. She's got an ejection fraction of about 10%. And she's ultimately diagnosed with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. She's put on a Berlin heart, thanks to our host city. And about a month later, she gets a heart transplant, and she's doing well. Unfortunately, we have never had an etiology to the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So for those of you with a seven-year-old, you know they can do this all day long. They never get tired. They're like energizer bunnies. So if you have a child who's fatigued, doesn't want to do anything, that's a problem. You need to start looking for cardiac disease in that patient. All right, so next we have a five-month-old with respiratory symptoms for a few days, some tachypnea, sees the PMD in the morning and gets a bronchodilator treatment, gets sent home. Later that, and basically sleeps all day. Later that day, shows up in the emergency department, and looks very ill. The ED recognizes that right away. The blood gas is horrible. The pH is 6.8, PCO2 is 97, and the lactate is 10. And gets immediately intubated and try not to focus on that right main stem bronchus. Yeah, we saw that. Um, and everybody's really focused on the respiratory status. They check a respiratory viral panel. She's parainfluenza positive. And gets sent up to the ICU with the diagnosis of parainfluenza pneumonia. But everybody's so focused on their respiratory status, nobody looks at the cardiomegaly. And it's not until a few hours later that someone goes, oh, by the way, wasn't there cardiomegaly? Um, a tr troponin BNP sent off, markedly elevated enzymes, and an echocardiogram shows that she has very dilated left side, and she ends up having severe aortic stenosis with an ejection fraction of about 10%. Um, these kids are usually walking a very fine line, and it's something really minimal, like a little respiratory infection, a little gastroenteritis, or a little something that pushes them over the edge completely. And did anybody think that this didn't add up right here? I mean, a pH of 6.8, a lactate of 10 in that x-ray? I mean, come on, that, it's not great x-ray, but it doesn't look like somebody that should present mostly dead to the emergency department. And remember, she was seen by a pediatrician earlier in the day. So yeah, that's right, because she's had two diagnoses. And we don't like to give children two diagnoses, um, but it sometimes happens. And she had right paraflu and congenital heart disease. But when you focus too closely on something and you get locked into that one diagnosis, you stop seeing the rest of the signs around you. Next, we have a four-month-old with tachypnea since birth. I love that, since birth. And intermittent perioral cyanosis. And the parents have been to medical providers multiple, multiple times about the tachypnea. And they've been reassured time and time again that that's normal, unfortunately. Um, and this time, she has some cough, goes to the PMD, gets a bronchodilator, goes home, shows back up in the ER the next day, and has worsening perioral cyanosis and some cough. And the emergency department takes one look at the patient and says, yeah, that's not normal. OK, that tachypnea and retractions, those aren't normal. But the parents are completely dismissive of it. Stop talking to me about that. I've been told that that's normal. That's how she always looks. I'm worried about the perioral cyanosis. 
yeah, well, at any rate, a chest x-ray is obtained, and this is what it looks like. And the patient obviously has an echocardiogram done, and she has super cardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Also, a BMP level is obtained. It's greater than 5,000. This patient had her intercurrent viral infection unmask her supercardiac, her supercardiac total veins, and that's really common, especially in this particular patient, in supercardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return. If you think something's abnormal, then it is abnormal, okay? Don't be falsely reassured by a parent that said, oh, she's been breathing like this since birth, or they've been eating like this and sweating since birth, or whatever they've been doing. If you feel like something's abnormal and you want to work it up, you work it up. You don't be falsely reassured by what the parent tells you. Next, we have a three-month-old with tachypnea and poor PO intake that presents to the ED with these problems. And she doesn't eat very well, and, or she seems like she's hungry, but every time she eats, she almost vomits immediately or she cries. And she's sitting there, she's pretty comfortable. She's comfortably tachypnic, you would say. And her saturations are like 90%, so she's on a little bit of oxygen. And she's not really fighting, she's really comfortable. The nurses are kind of fussing with her and putting things on, and she's just chill. She's just hanging out there, not doing anything. And this is an actual picture of her vital signs. Not that impressive. The heart rate's a little bit fast. Maybe slightly tachypnic there, right? This is her chest x-ray. It gets taken because of the oxygen requirement and the tachypnea. And she has an elevated BNP, and her echocardiogram shows, this is just a still footage and not a video, but a dilated left ventricle and an ejection fraction of 10%. She's diagnosed with viral myocarditis, she gets admitted, she's on milrinone, she gets some IVIG, she gets better in a couple weeks and she goes home. She could have just as easily had Al Kappa. Um, I, this is not what she had, but this is very similar to the presentation of Al Kappa. It can manifest any time from infancy to an adulthood, and it's basically desaturated blood perfusing, perfusing the whole left coronary system at low diastolic blood pressures. So you need to beware of the quiet tachypnea, the patient who has an increased respiratory rate without increased work of breathing. That can be a sign of poor systemic perfusion. And why do you think this child was so cooperative? Is it because she's really nice? No, it's because she had no cardiac output. She didn't even have enough cardiac output to cry and get upset. So if you see a really cooperative baby, that's not normal. <laughs> So next is a seven-week-old with feeding problems. He used to eat great for the first four weeks of life, and now the last three weeks, he's not eating very well. He's, you know, hungry, but throwing up, and small, frequent feeds. And the pediatrician has seen this baby 10 times in the last seven weeks. And he's trying to do everything to work up this, you know, failure to thrive and poor feeding and maybe reflux. So changing around the formulas, adding some medications on, some anti-reflux meds, nothing seems to be working, the patient's getting worse. So the pediatrician says, yep, time to admit you, you're gonna go to the pediatric ward and we're gonna put a nasogastric tube in for your failure to thrive and we'll, you know, we'll do a full workup. So gets admitted, nasogastric tube goes in, we get confirmation with a chest x-ray and oops, there's cardiomegaly. No one really expected that when they saw her. The hospitalist, when they saw her, thought, kid looked pretty well, just a little bit of tachypnea, but otherwise looked okay. This patient got an echocardiogram because of that, obviously. The ejection fraction is 10% and had severe coarctation of the aorta. So in every failure to, th for the hundreds of failure to thrive patients you're gonna see, there's gonna be that odd cardiac patient and it's gonna be your job to try to find him. And just because the doctor or doctors before you gave him a diagnosis, don't be blinded and not look for anything else because somebody else gave them a diagnosis, right? So beware of your own cognitive bias. And remember, each time you see a patient, you're looking through a fresh set of eyes, through a fresh perspective. Physical examination in children can be misleading. Obviously, that's one of the points of this talk here. Um, children can look great until right when they discompensate and fall off the cliff and have a cardiac arrest. That is not an uncommon story. 
a normal heart rate or a normal blood pressure does not necessarily equal good cardiac output. And if you, have a, if you see a child who's had multiple doctor visits, particularly for the same complaint over and over, and they're not getting better, you need to start broadening your differential and include the heart in that. You'll notice that we check B-type natriuretic peptide quite a bit. Um, we do find it really useful in our hospital. It helps differentiate respiratory versus cardiac um, disease. And uh, it's quite cheap. It's about $25 for us. Um, so any of these patients here that I just talked about can look totally normal, but basically be on the verge of death. So I know that you have a high index of suspicion for any neonate. I'd like you to keep in mind the older patient and recognize that that patient can have life-threatening cardiac disease as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michelle. A complex topic made extraordinarily simple. David, have we got one or two uh, comments or questions? Yeah, I think everyone loved the pediatrics. That was a, a necessary spin. Um, one of the things that came up on a few tweets is, what is the role for emergency doctors to order tests like BMP and troponin? Because those are yeah. tests that a lot of us don't order routinely. Yeah. I mean, from my standpoint, obviously I'm a cardiac intensivist, but I think those are pretty easy things to get. If you're already gonna get labs for something, maybe you think the kid just has some dehydration or maybe you're getting a white count because they've got a bit of heat or something, just add on a BNP. I don't know how, ex how expensive it is in your place, but it's quite cheap where I am, or troponin, either one. But I would, if I had to choose between the two, I would choose BNP because right, troponin is myocardial cells have already died, BNP is myocardium stressed, and for most pediatric patients, the myocardium is just stressed. It hasn't actually died yet, so that's the one I'd prefer. Excellent. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Another round of applause for Michelle.